Well, good morning. Welcome to all you who are online and, and everyone that's, that's here in house. My name's Art. I'm the pastor here. The concept of walking, the word walk, very strong word picture throughout the Bible. You know, when you walk with somebody, you, you walk next to them. And and when you walk with somebody, you walk in the same direction. And when you walk with somebody, you walk at the same pace. Now you can see why walk is such a strong metaphor throughout the Bible. We're, as God's people, we're called to walk with Him. We're here this morning to worship God, to exalt Him, and to learn from Him so that we might better be able to walk with him. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you would be exalted in our worship, that you would meet us in our needs, 
and that you teach us from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. your goodness I would be desperate without your love slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross you have won me with your kindness chase me down Sing hallelujah, thank you, 
you, Jesus. And hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood, you bomb my freedom. Hallelujah. For the cross. Good morning, Grace Church. My name is John Blanchard, the pastoral intern here at Grace. It's good to see you all this morning. Welcome if you're watching online. 
As always, as we get into announcements, we just want to remind you that if you haven't updated your information on our Grace website or Connect card, that you take the time to do that. It's important when we're trying to get inf information out there uh, for, for us to have the most current uh, of your information. So moving forward, we have a few things to announce. OCC, Operation Christmas Child, should be coming up. And this is something that Rachel Hazeltine is overseeing uh, to fill Christmas uh, boxes for kids. And so that'll be starting next week. There will be information out in the, in the lobby area. But if you have any questions about that, you can contact Rachel. She should have all the information. Along with that is October for kids ministry is going to be Socktober. And what that is is basically a sock drive. Uh, we're taking men's, women's, children's, all kinds of socks. Again, if you have any questions, you want to know any, any more information, you can contact Rachel. She has got it down. Next, we have a baby dedication coming up. That's going to be October 17th. Uh, we are going to be having a baby dedication, so if you have uh, some, someone in mind that maybe you would like to be, uh, participate in that, you can contact us at the church, and we will make sure that they can get involved and be a part of that. With that, uh, the Smiths, who usually sit up here, they are celebrating the birth of their new daughter, Reagan. And that she was born Friday, 8 pounds, 12 ounces, at 20 inches. And so it's an awesome moment for them. So if you're, if you're able to, just contact them and let them know that you're thinking about them, praying for them, and that, uh, that you're celebrating with them. We want to get into a time of prayer before uh, our next worship song, something that I feel, I, I feel like I'm led to do. So let's pray. Father, uh, as we announce things going on in the church, it's a time for us to reflect on the ministries that, that you have going on here. God, there's, there's so many things that we want you to really be, be with us in. And we want to make sure that we're led by you. God, we're thankful for the people who have decided to come here this morning, who've decided to, 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 to make their church home, Grace Church. But we pray that as we get into this, this last song of worship, as we get into this time of, uh, of, of the message, Lord, that you're here in this room. Because events are fun, helping is good, but what is it if you're not here? And we need you here. We need you here to celebrate. We need you here to mourn. We need you. And we just pray that in the hearts of all of us here this morning, all of us watching online, that the Holy Spirit is working, is moving, that you're glorified and honored. We love you, Lord. Amen. for me you won't forsake me you will 
Can have a seat. Good morning. I'm Mike Croy, one of the elders here at Grace. Uh, this time in our service, we're going to pray for our offering. Uh, there are a few ways you can do that. There's, there's boxes in the back. Uh, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we, we feel your presence here. Lord, but we're a hurting church. And we put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, as you provide for us, as you take care of our needs, as sometimes distant as that may seem, you are still a faithful God. And you still love us. You love us more than we can know. The fathers, we give back to you today. Let us do that with a love for you, with a thankfulness that doesn't really mean much with your sacrifice for us on the cross for our sins. Father, be with each one, whether we're here in person or viewing online. Father, may you continue to bless us and that you continue to love us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, um, as many of you are aware, Already, uh, Matt White Jr. Uh, died uh, in a car wreck late Friday night. So we want to take some time right now um, to pray for his dad, Matt uh, Sr., and the rest of the family. Um, you know, as they walk through this tough time, we were never meant, never meant to experience death, which is why so stinking hard. I 
especially when it's tragic like this. But when we're able to walk with God, we can find our way through. So let's pray. God, we've already turned to you a number of times this morning. We've prayed. We've lifted our voices in song. We've given. We've prayed. And we're praying again. We know you to be a good Heavenly Father. And we pray. We pray right now. And we want to thank you that uh, Matt had trusted you as a Savior, and that he's with you at this moment. Help us to find peace in that. God, uh, may your presence um, be known to Matt and his family. Uh, Lord, may you be a refuge for them, uh, a strong place for them to to go uh, during the storm of life. We pray for a peace as things swirl around them. Uh, We pray you'd strengthen their hope in you. Lord, meet them where they're at. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, here's a moment. Everybody grab a Kleenex. I'm going to grab my handkerchief. I'm going to turn around. Will you mute me, Michael? i got to blow my nose. Y'all can blow your nose. Thank you for indulging me with that uh, use of a handkerchief. A church is going to establish a fund um, to help Matt with the expenses. Um, So if you feel led to help out in that way, um, maybe not today, maybe today, uh, maybe later this week, even next week, let us know. Um, You can just designate your, your giving that way. Well, we're in the fourth week of our series in Genesis, and what I hope you've discovered so far is that the world that God created is much different than the world we live in today. He created a world that was perfect in every way. In fact, he said it was very good. There was a sense of harmony, a sense of oneness, a sense of peace between God and and man, between man and the creation. The, The animals were friends. God was a friend. The climate was perfect. It was always the right temperature. There was an abundance of food. There was an abundance of everything the first man and woman would ever need. It was perfect. That was God's intention. That's his intention for us. And then last week, we learned of a heartbreaking turn of events. When the man and the woman rebelled, disobeyed, they sinned, and they ate from the tree they were not supposed to. Now, we learned at the end of that wonderful creation story in chapter 2, verse 4, that there was a a literary marker that, that would change and the narrative and keep the narrative moving along. So instead of focusing now on on, uh, this general creation, now we're going to see what the outcome of that was. And we saw the beauty of how man and woman were created and how they were made for one another. And it it further amplified the the perfection of that creation. But that that same literary marker continues to flow, and it flowed into chapter 3. What was the outcome of of that creation, of that creation of man and woman, and it it flowed into chapter 3, and we saw last week that tragic turn of events. It was obvious from the narrative as it unfolded that the woman was deceived and sinned, and the man acted willfully and sinned, both of them disobeying God, both of them rebelling and sinning by eating the fruit. 
This week we're in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 24, and our title is Paradise Lost. Here we find out what has happened because of that sin. We find out the consequences of sin, and we understand why our world today is so broken and so painful and at times so lonely. Our study is going to be divided into three parts. We're going to look at verses 8 to 13, and we're, we're going to call that hiding. Verses 14 to 19, we're going to call consequences. And then verses 20 to 24, we're just going to call that an epilogue. So if you would, turn in your Bible, and we're going to read each section as we come to it. We won't read all, all the verses at once. But turn in your Bible, if you would, or scroll in your device to Genesis 3. We're going to look at verses 8 to 13 to start with this morning. Genesis 3, 8 to 13. Here's what God's word says. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. To gain proper perspective as we, we launch into these, these first verses, actually we need to back up into verse 7. Because in verse 7 it says, after they ate, their eyes were opened, and they both, um, they, they knew they were naked, and they, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. As soon as the man and woman ate the fruit, their eyes were opened. Now the question comes to mind, so what was different now? Well, by eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, they all of a sudden understood where evil lay. They never saw it before. Now they understood where it was that, that evil lay. They understood the potential for good and evil. They understood the potential for evil even in themselves. And they no longer felt a oneness with each other. They now felt vulnerable, vulnerable in front of each other where they hadn't before. They now understood the potential and that it was everywhere for evil. So they made loincloths and they hid in the bushes. See, what we're going to see today for our main idea is that sin wrecked everything. It, it just wrecked everything. So after covering their nakedness, they, they found, they faced a new problem. God came walking in the garden as was his practice. We can kind of infer as we look at this that, that this was something normal, but now they were hiding. We don't know how long it was since the seventh day. Some say it, it happened right at the end of the seventh day. I like to think that it happens sometime after, I don't know how far, but long enough where they would understand the oneness they had with God and that when he came walking in the garden, it was something to look forward to. It was something they could, could experience with him. They, 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 they could tell him the joys of the garden and, and being a good father, he wouldn't go, yeah, I know, I made it. What are you talking about? No, he said, tell me more. And he was involved in them, and, and, and they had fellowship one with the other. But, but now they're hiding because they realize that they no longer can trust one another, but they're also afraid of God because they have done what? They have now sinned and disobeyed him, and they are no longer walking with him. They're no longer going in the same direction. They're no longer walking at the same pace. They're no longer side by side.
The oneness that existed is now broken and gone. God comes now not to fellowship, not to fellowship, not to walk with the man and the woman, but to judge them because of their disobedience. The new reality of hiding from God and the loss of oneness with him is the result of sin. The new reality of hiding from God and the loss of oneness with him is the result of sin. And two questions arise here. They, they, they jumped off my computer screen as I was uh, typing this week, as I was writing. I guess you don't type anymore, do you? As I was keyboarding? As I was putting my thoughts on my computer. Two questions arose, and it was this. When I sin, how do I hide from God? When you sin, how do you hide from God? And the second question was, even worse, am I hiding now? Are you hiding now? God calls for the man. I find that kind of interesting. He doesn't call for, hey, y'all. He calls for the man. Because the man was created first and had the responsibility of leading the woman had the responsibility of communicating to the woman God's provisions and the one rule. So he calls out to the man, where are you? Now, you have to understand, God wasn't going, where are they? I, I don't see them. They didn't meet me in the garden. I wonder where they are. He, remember, he knows everything. So it wasn't like he was asking, well, well, where are you? It's like when you're playing hide-and-seek with a, with a three-year-old. You have to say, where are you, so they know you're looking for them because they're in plain sight. It'd be like that. And, and so God says, where are you? And the man answers the question. And now, it's not in the text, but I'm sure he said, we're, we're over here. I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. So, so God responds by asking him, who told you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to? See, God asks these questions not because he doesn't know, not because he doesn't know where they are or what they have done. He asks this so they have to verbalize and it makes it real when they verbalize it to God. That's the... That's the the hard part and the beauty of confession. It takes us into God's presence and we have to admit to him that he's God and we're not. So they, they, the, the man says, well, yeah, yeah, I did. H have you ever wondered why people are so quick to blame others? It's because, it's because it's in our nature. That's what the first man and first woman did. Hey, have you eaten from the tree? Well, the woman, and notice here that, that he's blaming both God and the woman. The woman that you gave me, those two things caused me to eat from the tree. It's really not my fault. But yes, I did eat from the tree. But, but it was that woman, you, God, gave me. God turns to the woman and the, the, the context, the, the, the construction of the Hebrew phrase is kind of like, what have you done? Is kind of the way God, it's verbalized in the text. What, what is this you have done? I, I can't believe this. What, what happened? And the woman responds by blaming again, the serpent deceived me and I ate. I think that's probably how it came out. The serpent deceived me and, uh, and I ate. Kind of like, Adam said, the woman that, that you gave me, uh, gave me the food and I ate. See, our tendency to blame others is something we come by naturally. It's a natural thing. When things go wrong, we don't, we don't want to take responsibility for whatever happened. We think if, if we sin, it really is not our fault, but but someone else's fault. And this is why we have such a strong victim mentality in our, 
in our nation today. Our culture's just kind of been sliding. But here's the hope we have, right? It's the gospel. And the Apostle John says this in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 9. He says this, if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to wash us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's, that's the power of the gospel. God knew that he, he would need to send a Savior who could, could help us begin to regain, if only a portion of what we had in Eden, that one day when, when Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom, we'll really experience what it's like. See, sins wrecked everything, but God provided a Savior. Amen? He provided a Savior so forgiveness would be possible. Okay, John, what should I say at this point? Should I say, church? A amen? Amen. See, John's not just learning from me. I'm learning from him. And I think we all need to. We, we need to say amen to that. God sent a Savior. He provided one. He kept his promise and said, I'm going to send someone. And forgiveness would be possible. That's amazing. You or I probably would have said, you sinned? You sinned? You're out. We're going to start over. No. That's not what God did. Consequences. Verses 14 to 19. Let's read those together. And, and for those of you that, that say that the, the, the ancient Jews, you know, didn't have a real good command of language, this is all in, in, in verse. This, this, this is not just prose. This is not a narrative. This isn't recording a dialogue between God and the man and the woman. Now, now it's put in, in a form that is easily embraced, a form that feels the emotion. It's put into a form that is going to be easily remembered. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. See now in these verses God declares what life is going to be like because of sin. He begins by, by cursing the serpent. Now the best way to understand the idea of curse means to be taken out of, removed from, separated by, from a place of blessing. In fact, all of creation is separated from the oneness of the garden. If you read Romans 8, 19 to 23, Paul there talks about how, how the, 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 the creation groans under the weight of sin and it longs for its own redemption. See, God's going to send a Savior who's not only going to provide salvation for for people, for humans, for mankind, but he's going he's gonna to redeem the whole world. He's going to make it right again. So he speaks to the, he speaks to the serpent. We, we, don't, we don't know if the serpent had legs and then didn't have legs, and that's why it has to crawl on the ground. The point, more importantly for us, may be this, that Above all the animals, all the beasts that God created, this would, would now be the, the lowest animal of them all. That all the animals and all humans would despise this 
creature and it would would metaphorically if not physically just eat dust for the rest of its existence forever living on the ground in the dust next God directs his comments at the devil who was the energizing power behind the spirit uh, behind the serpent The the second part of the curse means this. There will be hostility between the people who follow the devil and those who follow God. See, the devil's offspring are those who who follow the devil and work against God. Jesus stated this very clearly. He called the Jewish leaders in John 8, 44. He he said that they were of the devil, that they were children of him, that, that he was their father, the because of their opposition to the work of God. Now, the woman's offspring are those humans who choose to follow God and live in obedience. And here's the amazing thing. If you look at the end of verse 18, right here in the third chapter of Genesis, at the very beginning of the whole whole Bible, but also at the very beginning, if you will, of time, there's the kernel of God's promise to send a Redeemer through the woman's offspring. He says, he says this, there, there's going to be hostility between you and the woman, he's speaking of the devil, and there's going to be hostility between your offspring, the devil's, and, and her offspring, people. So the people that follow the devil or the people that follow God and, and are of, of the woman, there, there's going to be hostility there. And it says, he shall bruise your head. The idea is that he will crush the head of the devil. He's, he's going to win this ultimate battle. You, you will bruise his heel. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind, to, to be the redeemer, to atone for their sins. Yes, he died on the cross. His heel was bruised, but he crushed, he defeated the devil. He defeated sin. He defeated death when he died on that cross. And it's right here. Here's the promise at the very beginning. The, the first mention of, of one who's going to come and redeem. If you need further reference on that, you can go to Galatians 3, 16 and 19, and, and you'll see stuff there that, that helps us understand that Jesus came at the right time. In God's plan... As the, the progression of Revelation unfolded through the Old Testament into the New Testament, Jesus came in the exact moment that God wanted him to come. And he lived on this earth, and he lived a perfect life on this earth, and then at the exact moment, he gave of himself. He gave up his life. He wasn't a victim. He gave his life, and he died on the cross for us. And if we choose to believe that he is indeed God and that he died for us, and we cry out, oh God, save me, then, then we're born again, as Jesus would mention. We're saved from our sin, and we'll spend eternity with God. The provision of a Savior makes the forgiveness of sin possible. When our sin is forgiven, we're able to walk with God. Now God turns to the woman and addresses her specifically. He addresses her because of her disobedience and rebellion, and God states that the pain in childbearing will be multiplied. The word for childbearing literally means conception. It's thought that this really is a is a metaphor, a word picture, a figure of speech that signifies the whole of childbearing from beginning to end and that the pain of of raising children is going to be multiplied to the woman from the beginning to the end Debbie and I are now empty nesters we don't have kids under our roof we're still parents and there's times it still drives us nuts because we're parents so the, the pain of childbearing started when they were born, but it continues because they're, they, they, they left the house, but we, they're, they're still our kids. 
and it's multiplied. It was never meant to be this painful experience. Parenting is painful, especially for mothers. And it's all because of sin. Sin wrecked everything. Next, uh, God addresses the woman's desire. He says, your desire will be for your husband. Now, this doesn't mean there's, there's this romantic, oh, I long for my husband. He's so wonderful. That's not what this word means. We get a good picture of what this word means if we look just one chapter in, chapter 4, verse 7. Here, sin is said, sin is, is, is personified, and it's said to be crouching at the door of Cain, and its desire is for him. In other words, it wants to devour him. It wants to lead him. It wants to control his life, lead him down the path following the devil. And so we, we take that context because the word desire can, can, can kind of go both ways. But here, the context tells us that the woman's desire forever is to be in control of and lead in the relationship, control the man which is what she did with the fruit. She took it, she gave it to him, and he ate. She usurped his authority, and she's going to always want to do that. She's always going to want to take over his authority. She's always going to want to lead in the relationship. The second part of the verse tells us that the man will rule over the woman. The word for rule means to have dominion over it. It, it, It's not a loving leadership. It's the acts of a tyrant, really. So do you see what's happening? The the, the oneness that they experienced before sin, the the way God intended their relationship to be, is now destroyed. And it's now going to be marked by, by conflict instead. Why is marriage so hard? Sin. Well, that sounds rather simple and trite, Pastor. Well, it is. Sin wrecked everything. Now there's conflict built in to a marriage because of the way we the way we're born. We're born with that that propensity, that that tendency, that that inner drive to dominate, to lead, to take over. The gospel makes it possible though. The gospel makes it possible. Don't miss this. The gospel makes it possible for a man and a woman to experience oneness in marriage. That's the beauty of the gospel. It, it, it's God's attempt to begin to change things now as he redeems us. We, we begin to experience a little bit of what it was like before sin entered the world. And we know that one day he'll complete what he started in us. And we'll be like Jesus. gospel makes it possible. It's the gospel that changes things. Sin wrecked everything, but the gospel, the gospel begins to put it right. It makes it right in your own life, and then you can make it right with other people and the way you live life. The man's consequences for listening to his wife and choosing to eat fruit is stated last. It's kind of like a reverse order. He doesn't start with the man, even though the man was the primary leader in the situation. He ends with him. God says the ground will no longer be abundant. It will no longer abundantly produce for you. It will instead produce produce thorns and thistles. It will be dry. It will be rocky. It will be hard. It's going to have pests. It's going to have weeds. It's going to have thorns and thistles. God says in pain, same word used for the woman, that her pain would be multiplied in childbearing. In pain, you will eat from the ground all the days of your life, he says. By the sweat of your face, you'll get your food. Life will be painful, hard work. Why is life the way it is today? It's because of sin. Sin wrecked everything. Life is filled with painful, hard work, and and the oneness with creation is gone. You don't have to be a farmer for this to apply to you. All of us work jobs, and all of us have toil, and there's parts of our job we don't like. And our job produces thorns and thistles. The conditions of life will be hard work and painful toil, God tells us. 
the Hebrew prof I had in seminary years and years ago said this in, in kind of a summary statement. He said the oracles, that is, these things that God has laid out as consequences, the oracles thus all reflect Italianic justice, kind of an eye for an eye. The oracles thus all reflect Italianic justice. They, they sin, that is, the man and the woman sinned by eating and so would suffer to eat. She led her husband to sin and so would be mastered by him. They brought pain into the world by their disobedience and so would have painful toil in their respective lives. And the serpent ruined the human race and so he would be destroyed. See, sin wrecked everything. Finally, we have a, an epilogue here, verses 20 to to 24. The, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was mother of all living and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest, we, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The man and the woman were expelled from the garden. They were expelled and now begin to life in a new way. G uh, Adam takes, takes the role of the leader here, and he names his wife Eve, and he says to her, this, this name I give you because... You are going to be the mother of, of the human race. And in this, Adam sees the promise from verse 15. He was listening to the, the, the Lord as he spoke to the woman, and he realizes he's, he's looking ahead. Adam looks ahead with hope to a Savior. It's going to come through Eve. She's going to be the, the mother of living. Those who are going to live forever with God are going to, the, the Redeemer is going to come from her. And he looks ahead with hope to, to, to a Savior. And the forgiveness of sin, in spite of this sinful, broken world that he and his wife are now going to inhabit, he, he looks ahead with hope for the forgiveness of sin. One more thing we probably should think about here real quick is God graciously clothed the man and the woman with animal skins. Now remember, they were friends with the animals. They knew all the animals. Adam had named them all. And when they went to cover their own sin, they just, they did whatever they thought they could do, and they, they grabbed big leaves and made loincloths. But now God says, no, nah, that's not going to cut it. Because the wages of sin is death. And so a, a couple animals give their life. God takes their life to clothe Adam and Eve in garments of skin, animal skin, to better cover their nakedness, but to remind them that every time they put those clothes on, a friend died for them to atone for, to cover their sin. And they realized this, and we need to realize this as well. Sin is never isolated to an individual, to ourselves. But it touches everyone around us. Every time they put those garments on, they would think to themselves, we sinned, and it touched everything around us. It touched the ground. It, it, it touched our relationship with God. And these two animals whom we knew as friends gave their lives because of us. But the provision of a Savior makes the forgiveness of sin possible. We can't forget this. We can't forget the gospel in this tragic story because it's there. God could have wiped them out. God could have made their life miserable with no hope of, of any kind of redemption, but that's not the message we get this morning. God had a plan to send a Savior, one who could redeem. See, sin wrecked everything. It wrecked everything. Two action points here as we close. First is believe Christ is God. Confess your sin and ask him to save you. If you've never done that now, now would be the time. 
There's no reason to, to put it off. The second thing is this. If you know Christ as your Savior, it is really good if you begin to develop a, a, a spiritual discipline of confession, of, of regular confession, a, a regular discipline anchored to, to what the Apostle John wrote in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, how do we stay in relationship with God? If we confess our th- sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how we stay in step with him. It's how we walk in the light with him. By admitting, yes, I've, I've sinned. I'm no longer going to hide in the dark. I'm going to bring it out. And, and that is, you know, you might be saved, but we all sin still. Like sin isn't eradicated, isn't removed from our, our lives. It, it's still part of who we are, and we wrestle with it all the time. And finally, we can rejoice because God sent a Savior. He sent a Savior. Take a few moments of just quietness in your own heart. Reflect on what was spoken. Take some time to pray as well. Um, as we've mentioned already, pray for Matt and his family. Maybe you have, I, I don't know what baggage, you don't know what baggage we've brought in, that, that I've brought in, that you've brought in this morning, but maybe give that to God too in this time. Let's take a few moments of, of quiet here and then I'll close this in prayer. We sang earlier, God, we, we, we sang earlier about arms wide open. And I, I pray, God, that this morning we would, would have arms wide open. I pray, God, that you would work in lives, in the life of someone who's maybe never put their faith in you or, or in the life of someone who's hiding from you right now. Lord, I also pray that you'd give us opportunities to talk about your greatness and your goodness and your plan of redemption. Open our eyes to those opportunities when they come, Lord, and may you be glorified in us speaking of your goodness. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who Now robed in majesty, the radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see.
God, as we leave this place, I ask you a blessing on each of us. Uh, Lord, a blessing of a multitude of your grace and a multitude of your peace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We love you all.